Hello and welcome to Design Chat, the best live design discussion on the internet. I'm your host, Ryan McGovern. On Twitter, I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Every week, we bring together some of the coolest people in the design community to share one on one, face to face, mano e mano, and talk about our passions, talk about design, and bring together the design community. We break down corporate and competitive barriers, and we unite as designers, as creatives, which we need to do more. I think we all need to do that a little bit more, which is a lot of fun. So this week, we've got Terry Marks uh, from Seattle. Welcome, Terry. Thank Golf you. clap. Thank you for coming out. Glad to be here. I'm actually haven't gone anywhere. I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> All the way from Seattle, wearing no pants, yep. I should mention. Terry, for audience members who don't know, Terry is pantsless tonight, and you will do the remaining part of the show completely pantsless. You know, I don't know where he got that. I, I, I think uh, we all have a dream, and uh, <laughs> we have to chase it. <laughs> You're getting me teary-eyed. Oh, my God. Cool. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming out. Um, one of the things no that we usually do to kick off the show is that uh, well, just do a little a sort of brief bio, who you are, what you do, why you do it, and how awesome are you? You know, I'm not the guy to be asking uh, that question because uh, just like most designers, I don't want to talk about myself too much. Um, I fell into design. I was told by a guy in my uh, public relations class I should become a designer. Uh, okay, risky business dancing. We'll work on that. Uh, I'll have to get to the part of the house nice. with the uh, hardwood floors, though. Um, right, right. And I fell into design. I got hired by a design company before I graduated for some odd reason. I had a double major of home ec and auto shop and uh, just got asked to do that. And actually, I, I didn't know anything about design. I fell into it. And I learned on the job. And I really wanted to go to Seattle. I was living about an hour south, and I thought I have to move to Seattle. And I thought in a perfect world I could get a job at Hornell Anderson or something like that. And by the time I real I thought I had enough skills in a portfolio, I realized I had a business. So I just kept going with that. I'm probably known for doing a lot of nonprofit work um, under the auspices of AIGA with the Link program, works with high school students. Was a co-chair of a big book mm -hmm. for Art with Heart, another nonprofit. Um, have spoken at How three times. Have written a couple books for Rockport. Um, have done over 30 logos for DC Comics. Have clients all across the country oh, doing cool. a number of different things, and that's about it. Totally exciting, and also you're very active, like you said, in the AIGA and <laughs> design community. Uh, mm -hmm. in, and that sort of thing, and that's and that's awesome, and that's one of the reasons that we sort of connected is that you're going to be involved in the Archive 10 show for the STA Society of Ty uh, Typographic Arts in Chicago. So why don't you tell us a little bit yep. about that? Well, you know, I, I'm not terribly familiar with it. Obviously, I'm from Seattle. I know that the organization is, uh, gosh, started... It's been around for more than 80 years. It changed names for a while mm -hmm. and came back to STA. It's very prestigious. Um, I'm really excited about judging something like that. I've, I've judged things like uh, the Step Inside 100 and the Hound Annual and all that good stuff. But uh, obviously Chicago has incredible design, uh, and I look forward to stealing a lot of good ideas. So, <laughs> uh, so And that will culminate in the fall. I believe it's in October, if I remember correctly. Bob Zini uh, will reach out via mm -hmm. email He'll correct me, you. I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and there's going to be a gala event downtown Chicago, uh, and everybody's going to be there. It's going to be a fantastic time. If you're in Chicago, please go. If you're not in Chicago, buy tickets. Please go. So it's going to be a good time for sure. Uh, you know, great way to get out and meet a lot of people in the design community. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so... Let's get into a little bit about sort of how you run your business. Uh, this uh, a, a conversation that a, a sort of topic that I like bringing up a lot is designers sort of have, um, and especially right out of school, uh, difficulty with understanding the transition from, you know, you, you're in design school, you can do whatever you want, and it's all fun and games, and then you get out, and, and all of a sudden you've got to make money. You've got to turn it into a business somehow and manage a business, and that sounds like something you were able to do very successfully. So talk a little bit about that transition and how you sort of like hit the bumps in the road and, and what were your major lessons there? 
Uh, I, I really didn't know anything at all. I started freelancing while I was working full time. And the reason I started my own business is because I realized that I was actually uh, working more on my stuff than I was at work. And uh, let's see, I would get up like four in the morning, finish a project, meet a client, get approval, go to work, take a break at lunch, go do my stuff, work the rest of the day go to the gym and then work all night on my stuff get up at four and do it again and my roommate used a technical term to describe what I was becoming in that and I think it was because I never slept sorry is this rated PG-13 um, no, and so I quit my job and I didn't know what I was doing I got one good piece of advice uh, from a guy who was a business advisor he says if someone hands you a check take it and so I used that as my mantra for a number of years and I, I really just ran on desire uh, throwing everything I had at it I realized I had an opportunity and I had to learn so I, I went to Seattle where the bar was much higher where the, than where I was and I met some really great people uh, Glenn Mitsui, Jessica Okilo who were both involved with the AIGA at the time and uh, I, I think it was partly because they saw me as the Korean contingent of their Pan-Asian group. They had a Chinese guy, a Japanese guy, a Filipino guy, so I guess I fit the <laughs> slot. And uh, I reminded them of Glenn, so uh, that was really a good thing for me because I had an immediate sense of belonging, and I, I got my chops kind of on my own. But as far as the business thing, it, it took me a lot longer than it probably should have. Um, I, I'd like to say them... Uh, a late bloomer. Uh, I have a friend who actually is a uh, business development consultant and he's been for years trying to get me to take his you know executive business development thing. I'm like no I'm an artist man I can't do that and uh, I actually sat down with him a number of times and for so long I think the whole thing was fueled on excitement commitment and an ability not to not have to sleep and now I'm much more strategic about how we discuss with clients about who we work with uh -huh. um, we've all worked with big entities and we made a decision years ago to work with decision makers and sometimes that means we work with small or mid-sized uh, companies and that's great because we actually get stuff done we can actually affect a change um, people always talk about story right now story is really important to me you've had Justin Aaron's on uh -huh. I think and uh, yeah we've collaborated three or four times on some stuff and ostensibly we've done the writing he did a big book on uh, three feasts it was uh, three four course dinners in Napa Valley um, I coordinated that and I did the writing for the book uh, that was really fun another thing Mr. Crumbly Dreams of Tiger which looks like a children's uh -huh. book but it's really just a story about fear and desire writing and story content has is is really what I'm excited about I work with film guys if you go to right. my website see a couple of things that we do and uh, I want to create more room for that and instead of trying to create a 40 or 80 person firm I'm much more concerned with uh, right now I it the whole thing's an experiment but I'm, I'm really concerned with doing stuff that is meaningful to me and that can be both funny or sublime and that's the stuff I think we do really well I think we're seeing a, a movement right now where a lot of people who prior had no uh, experience in video and film and storytelling, well, not specifically mm -hmm. storytelling, are getting into that because of, because of the, the tools that were uh, getting are being put out that are available um, to people who mm -hmm. are just starting out. The tools are getting easier to use, and I think that's a trend that's going to keep on going. And it's very exciting to see, like, I'll, I'll see photographers come through our agency who you know had never done film before, but now because they have their HD HD cameras, you know that do still mm -hmm. uh, HD and video HD, these people who have this knowledge of how to tell a whole story in one frame now have the ability to tell it over t two minutes, right? And it's using and the use same time. tool that they were mm -hmm. using for their job anyway. Well, hopefully it's, it's two very minutes interesting because right if now. it goes any longer, it's painful. Mm -hmm. I think uh, could, people who totally. direct and shoot film. <laughs> people who direct and shoot film are rolling their eyes at us too just like we freak out when someone says well my nephew has a Mac why doesn't he do it because there's so much more than having the tool right, um, right. but I, I think you're right there's convergence uh, early on in my career people said you could be a writer you could be an illustrator or you can be a designer there's no way you can be all three and I've always illustrated written and done design and I think the only way I've been able to sustain that is by working on my own. I have my own shop. 
And I, I really well, you like know what, you uh, Gary, you're probably bit. right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, go I'm ahead. Trades master for that. Uh, I really like what you're saying earlier, uh, a second ago, about how you made the decision with uh, your company. You're going to work with decision makers, and it seems like mm -hmm. you know we t we sort of talk a little bit about the road to happiness. You know, w what is the ideal mm -hmm. situation if you're a designer or a creative? How you want to work? How or if you've got a small company, how how are you going to form those relationships with your clients? And it, it's a theme that comes up a lot. Is that um, in order to get the best piece of communication possible? You need to be working with the people in your with your clients uh, group mm -hmm. who have that ability to make those decisions and say yes not the person who's gonna say oh well I like it because it's blue and that's my favorite color and I'm gonna show this to my boss mm -hmm. and see what he thinks and then I'm gonna show it to my wife and I'm gonna show it to my kid and the and but then then they come back and they don't like it and we you, you can't do anything about it anyway um you know, you're going to get that at any level. When you're working with the largest companies, we've found that we end up working with some sort of middle manager who reports to six people who sit above in darkness that we never know. And yeah. the night before the things do, they say, uh, get this done. We need it at 8 tomorrow morning. So it's, it's, not, it's a broken process. And if they're not involved in the development decision making, you can never really get to a great idea. I just want to remind the audience really quick, we do take questions from the audience. You can uh, say, mm -hmm. you click on the button to the right that says submit a question. You can uh, submit a text question or you can submit a video question and we take them throughout the whole chat. We are going to do a sort of a shortened version tonight, about a half hour, so we've got another 15, 20 minutes maybe, um, and, then, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, so the first question tonight comes from uh, Dan Shapiro, or actually, broadcast call, oh, it's a video question. Very exciting, cool. Let's bring him on, Dan. Hey, 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 okay, there we go. Okay, so my question, I mean, I'm hearing the feedback, I'm sorry, that always throws me. Um, my question was, every every region has a style of design, Seattle being one of them, especially in print, you mm -hmm. know, you guys use a lot of earth tones, similar to us. How are you going to carry that over into video editing? Because everybody's using, like, After Effects now, and, you know, you have all these flashy motion graphics, but here, you know, especially, like, Seattle, Chicago, the Southwest, everybody is more, like, mm -hmm. earth tones and stuff. How do you think we're going to carry that over into After Effects and whatnot? Well, you know, I don't even know if it's about a particular palette uh, when it comes to video or even design. I think it has much more to do with what you're trying to express. If it makes sense with the subject matter and the message that's being carried across, great. And if not, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, in terms of kind of regional palettes and looks, again, it really has to do with the, what you're doing. In film and video, a lot of times, uh, I like to really pare it down and make it what's in the camera. So. You know, it's, it's not about the flash and glitz because, you know, everybody's got After Effects. And a lot of times it's like when flash hit heavy on the web, it was everywhere, right? And was it always necessary? Did it really extend the message? Did it really create the message? I don't know if it always did. And the same thing sometimes with After Effects. It's cool and it's pretty, but is it cogent to what you're really trying to say? Um, I, I think I, I like the quote that talks about originality. And people get so excited about originality. But I think being true is much more important than original because if you're true originality doesn't matter again another subject we hit on a lot uh, which just sort of started to come up is the influence of technology on design in your work and your communication what what's going on right now that's catching your eye with technology good or, or bad that's influencing our world of design hmm. what's going on well this is nothing new but Every client in the world, especially if they're uh, an experienced marketing department or a marketer who, who consults with one of our clients, uh, the quickest answer they have these days is just buy stock, you know, buy stock photography. And it's creating this huge degree of sameness. And everything does look the same. And I really mourn the loss of the days when you could commission an illustration for a particular feel and grit. And I, I Mm -hmm. I, I think illustration is trying to make a comeback, but it's really hard because in terms of a client project, you have to justify the cost and the extra time. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's really important. Is that helpful at all? And the I other thing that's, is that that's... stock sucks, yes. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. You were going to continue with that. Uh, no, go ahead. No, you. I think it's really unfortunate. You know, it's sort of it's sort of a double-edged sword 
where the, um, we were just talking about this today, that the old presses and the old ways of um, laying out design with these huge machines that had cameras and everything mm -hmm. that, that, that made the job so much harder but extended the amount of time it took to do it, um, which also in turn made, made the planning process ahead of time so much more important and making sure that you were already headed in the right direction. But now we have these tools where a client can call up and say, I want to completely change the concept, and it's due tomorrow. And we can do that. We can still turn it around. It's difficult and maybe not the best way of working, but we can. Um, so I kind of think the stock photography move movement is almost directly um, reflected by that in, in that it's, it's all about accessibility. It's all about turning it around and having something quick there, quick, che cheap, and easy to get it out. And I totally agree that it's it's – it's hurting the world of design right now where everything is starting to look the same. And especially when you start getting into the, like the eye stock, like illustrations, mm -hmm. one, the one popular style of design in the illustrations, all the flourishes and stuff that hit and it just went nuts and it's everywhere. And you see the yeah. same, it's funny. You can walk down the street and see, pick out an illustration that you saw in eye stock two weeks ago. Absolutely you can, and we're going to be laughing at it. You're doing it already. As for those days, when was it like, uh, you probably weren't even you know, out of school. I think it was like the early 90s. Everything was like Futura Extra Bold Condensed. You know, you can just pick a color palette for an epoch, and it's, it's really great when someone shatters that. That's why, you know, I think collaboration is huge uh, with photographers, with other writers, with other designers and at the same time once in a while somebody comes along with a voice because they have a vision and it kind of shatters everything and that's that's what I think design is really ripe for right now there's a lot of great stuff going on because people are going back to um, more hand processes using you know letter presses everywhere these days and it's still beautiful mm -hmm. and there's something about a, a tactile thing where you got to roll up your sleeves and get it done I just had a question in my mind and it totally escaped me. Audience, we don't have a lot of time left. Please submit some more questions here and keep the conversation going. Don't be uh, shy. We've got 58 participants. Uh, and 38 of those are spectators. That means you're not signed in. Please sign in. Ask some questions. Participate in the community. Uh, it's for the better of the design community. Um, Adam Groom just asked a question. Uh, what inspires me the most? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I think I touched upon it when somebody has uh, a vision. Um, people always talk about vision. You know, when you meet with a client, I, I love it. They always say, well, our vision is this. And half the time their vision is to increase profits by 20%. And that's not vision, that's commerce. And I, I heard a quote that yeah. said, uh, vision is where your place of deepest joy intersects with your best hope for humanity. And that's vision. And when somebody has a vision, that's exciting, especially if it's a client and you have the luxury of getting paid to help them express that. Um, the question I was thinking of was, in the beginning of your sort of relationship with a client or the beginning of a project, what do you do to sort of set up the client's expectations as far as, you know, timing, what they're going to get, how they're going to get it, the process that you guys use? And what is that process that, you know, that you guys go through as a, as a creative group to get to your end result? Um, that's kind of a two-part question. How do we set up the client expectation? was the first part is that correct mm -hmm. um, yes a lot of it has to do with uh, client need um, as you know sometimes you get the call two weeks before a trade show and they say our, our last group failed us miserably we need you to save us mm -hmm. and so that it's it's a commando run which is often fun and often lucrative which is good but mostly it's it's about figuring out what the needs are and the real trick with a client is to not just become a service in a set of hands because anybody can do that who has chops. Um, I think it's much more important to become a trusted advisor. So instead of sitting on the opposite side of the table from them metaphorically, to be sitting next to them and, and looking at the problem saying, okay, what, what's the problem here? In fact, we don't really ask clients, what do you want us to do? We, I ask them, what's the biggest problem you're facing? And that starts getting at what they're really after. Because sometimes they'll say, we need a brochure. But that's, that's completely aside from what the problem is. And it's not a good solution. So we usually go towards what's the problem. And if they will extend enough trust to us, 
then we start saying, okay, if that's the problem, we break that down as to how we see the best means of solving that, and we map it out from there, and it's pretty simple. Um, we do have a text question here. Let's go ahead and pop that up. Mm -hmm. um, M. Thomas asks, as a photographer, I keep hearing that I am selling an experience, not a product. She wants to know, is that the same for design? Um, I, I think an experience, I, to a large extent, yes, because everything we do is custom. Uh, we're solving problems for people. That's when it's fun, when, it's, when you'd have to do the same newsletter um, every week for 52 weeks a year. That's designed by the pound, practically. Um, I think it is an experience, but I think it's more than that. Uh, I, I think when you have an opportunity to kind of tap into something larger, um, that, that hopefully what you're working on is about, that uh, can make an emotional connection, then you're really doing something. Um, it, I, I think that's true. Yeah, I'll go with yes. Yes. Um, hold on one second. Got to switch back. Please. And drop text question. Um, I read in a little interview uh, uh, that I did in, in a, my quick Google search on everything I could find out about uh, Terry Marks um, that at one point you were crowned the <laughs> it king was a quick search. of two color. Right. The king, the Tacoma, you, you were working for the Tacoma Chamber of Commerce. And you became known mm -hmm. as Tacoma's King of Two Color while promoting the rich business climate of the town. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, that's so, I, I'm of the opinion that so few designers who are sort of coming into the field right now are going to be familiar with what that even means, right? And, and right. the sort of world, the realm that you are working in to become known as the King of Two Color for, for promoting, you know, business and that sort of thing. Um, and I, you know, it's kind of unfortunate, you know, and it, you, you were mentioning that we are getting back to a time where people want to work with their hands again, and hopefully some of these people are getting back to those processes where they have to rely on just two colors to communicate their message, and mm -hmm. maybe the color of the paper on top of that. Tell us a, a little bit of, about some of those experiences. Uh, it made me smarter as a designer. Um, it used to be, right now, process color is cheap to print, right? It's everywhere. You just poop it out of the computer, somebody prints it somewhere, you send them a file. Um, it used to be that process, four color process, was really expensive. And two color was cheap, especially uh, when you're just, you know, setting up files in a computer. Mm -hmm. And so the trick was how do we manipulate that as much as possible for the greatest effect. If you think about um, rock posters, sometimes some of the best ones are one or two color because they're just right. so stark. You know, they just read so beautifully. I mean, we're awash. Every region has it. But, you know, we're kind of spoiled with Art Chantry and Modern Dog and, and patent pending around here. But CMYK, like Shampton said, is everywhere. And, but then two color was cheaper so you had to learn how to do stack screens and, and tints mattered and you would actually go proof tints at the printer it was crazy and it was a, a means of getting the most out of very little and sometimes doing a you gave up two colors so you could do a blind emboss with one color and it was actually more elegant and more impactful mm -hmm. so it just made me made me realize you know gosh I hate to say this because it's so corny sometimes less is more you know and and you know slathering more, on more poo on top of the the paper doesn't really help, you know. Anyway. Art Chantry was on the show uh, about three or four weeks ago. Um, we did, uh, for there was Chicago, did a design week with AIGA, and he came on, and we did a live show uh, with a group at Columbia College. It was a lot of fun. And near the end, we had some technical difficulties, and we couldn't get his camera on. So we, I called him on the phone and then put the phone up to the microphone, and I went, Art Chantry, final words of advice for these, <laughs> these young students. And he goes, carry a gun. Friggin' hilarious. The whole crowd was, just blew up. Such a fun guy to talk to. I had to mention that. Um, so we've got another text question here we're going to bring up. Uh, Christino Tassari asks, Terry, do you have global clients or just U.S. clients? Uh, let me think. It, it's really just U.S. clients. I really wish I could say global, but at the moment, no. answer. Uh, another question from Gary Holmes wants to know what did you learn from interviewing designers on book good design work um, you know there were so many people I, I wrote a book for Rockport called good design and 
it was interviews of 30 different designers from around the globe. Um, I, I want to say smart ass things like getting artwork from designers is really painful and four times as much work as writing a book. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I got to meet some people, you know, even over the phone, like Kit Heinrichs and, uh, you know, Paul Sayre and guys like this who are phenomenal. Um, Sean Adams, who you know, uh, they were great uh -huh. contributors. Gail Anderson, who used to be at Rolling Stone and now is with Spotco in New York. Um, I, I think the thing that each of these people have done, uh, aside from be successful in design, and that can be sliced a lot of different ways, is that they have kept this kind of playfulness and joy about design. They never let it become merely a job. They take it very seriously, but at the same time they have this um, this wonderment about it, uh, about its power and what it can do, and they really love doing it. Not just for the sake of doing it, but making all these things intersect so it's meaningful. Very moving. Um, it's, it, I wonder about that a lot too. When, you know, when I'm 20 years into my career, when I'm 30 years in my career, what's, what's still going to be the motivating factor for me? And, and mm -hmm. you know, where am I going to let that take me? Or, you know, will I have fallen into a rut where, you know, I, I talk to a lot of my friends, you know, they'll be at a job for two or three years at, at an agency and they're like, oh, I don't like where this agency is going and, you know, management, da, 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 da. And you can hear in their voice that when they wake up in the morning, they don't want to go to work. They don't want to go into nope. the agency and, and trudge through, you know, junk all day because they're not happy with their situation. So what is it that motivates you to go in and, and run your group every day and keep that ball rolling? Well, I think it's the things we talked about. And, and you're catching me at a great time because I just, like, toss the chessboard upside down. I'm shaking it up because I haven't been really excited about work because it's been about uh, feeding the machine. It's been about finding more of the right clients. And uh, uh -huh. it hasn't been about as much of the stuff that, that I love to do. I've, I've spent a lot of time at Hat Show Print in Nashville printing my own stuff. Um, I've, 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 you know, just stuff to edify what I'm doing because I think some of the best design comes from way outside of design because of other influences and what we have as a designer is a lens and there's some people who are so good at it um, <laughs> Blackhawks, Flyers, okay thanks for the update um, what's a, I oh, think I what's motivating what's me score? Two, oh wait, I thought it was 2-1, now it's 2-2 two, two, two. Two. Yeah, it's 2-2 two, yep. two. Oh boy. We're detracting um, from the wow. sports world. I can't believe anyone's I, here. I think that's a powerful thing. <laughs> um, yeah, boys. What do you do? Um, right now yes, I'm trying yes. to I'm trying to decide what's next. I, I I really want to find something I can throw myself at. And um, you it's no secret, every eight to twelve years there's a big economic crunch for one reason or another. You don't see a lot of fifty three year old designers behind farms of cubes because every eight to eleven or twelve years something happens and people go like you were saying I don't love what I'm doing and mm -hmm. we have a luxury in our society to potentially love what we're doing and most designers do it out of passion and love and so I think there's mm -hmm. a great weeding out and because of it you know you end up with great restaurant tours and other things <laughs> because people leave design to something that they actually love more um, Right now, what motivates me uh, is getting the work done so I can get home and see my family. I, it's big, big, big for me. But also, uh, uh -huh. I, I think the next 15, 20 years are going to be where I'm going to do my best work. And I want to make sure it's stuff I, I really can put myself into. So uh, we're talking to a lot of new clients and, and things that uh, excite me. So we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, we're going to take a couple more questions, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap it up and keep this thing moving. Um, so the next question comes from John Steinkamp. How much marketing knowledge does a designer need to have, especially one working at an agency? As much as you possibly can get, because it's going to make you sharper in your design. The, the questions that you know, we all know them. Who's going to get it? Why does it matter to them? Um, 
all that stuff is going to feed the whole thing but if you can see the whole pie this is our marketing plan for the year this is where this cog fits in the overall scheme it's going to make you better sometimes at an agency it gets tough because you end up being a uh, a task monkey because it's like make this pretty get that done and knowing the background and how how it's motivated or how it should be motivating the recipient uh, whatever you're working on is going to make a vast difference in its effectiveness. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. In, in, in I've, I've worked at a number of agencies, and, and you can get kind of stuck in that rut where you feel like a cog in the wheel, and you know mm -hmm. where you don't feel like you're actually contributing uh, to the greater picture. You know, because there's so many people involved. I mean, even before, mm -hmm. you know, to, to have an influence on a project. You have to do something that's so amazing that everybody buys off on it, and as more people latch onto it, it becomes a bigger idea, and then you're like a, a little tiny part of it. And it, it is a struggle, but it's—I mean, sometimes I, I mean you can find that sort of exciting, the game of that, you know, to to get that one piece in there that's going to make that impact mm -hmm. is a lot of fun, I think. All right, absolutely. Uh, two more and the same. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I, we got, John, we got like, just that, say, that little lag that's doing that to us. <laughs> it's like a bad date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an awkward conversation. Not, 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 what comes next? I don't know. So let's make it simple. Let's put a question up there. So in what ways can we apply design thinking to solving social problems from Paul Stonier? You know, I wish I had a hard and fast answer to that. Uh, it, for years, I think, when designers were asked to help to do things, it, it was always, oh, can you just make a brochure for this nonprofit? And there's so much more than go on that can happen with that because um, this, is, this is nothing new. Uh, that the idea that great design is where facility and beauty intersect, right? Nothing new. But I, I think that it can be applied in so many ways. I, uh, you had uh, Emily Pilliton on, and the things, I don't what they called it, the water hippo thing, and, and the glasses mm -hmm. that fill up with some sort of fluid so you can adjust the uh, yeah. prescription for anyone in the field. This is great thinking. Uh, in the little book, Good Design, that I did for Rockport, we instead of just talking about graph design, we talked about film, and we talked about Gail Anderson's collection of bottle caps. We talked about things like a simple wine key or the recycled um, shopping bag, um, the the nail bar. The na it's called the Wonder Bar because there's a little bend in it. You know what is good design? Is this good design or not, and why? Because uh, I think uh, most design thinkers. Uh, really strong design thinkers and this is where people are going to say you know you can't be a jack of all trades of course not but people have uh, expertises and some people who are great um, design thinkers can apply that in a lot of different ways be it uh, for three-dimensional things and spatial thinking or around social problems about how people interact um, I, I guess the answer to that question is really remains to be seen and I think we're at a point where design can really step in as long as we we take the cause as a more important thing than design itself. And speaking of social, a uh, reminder to everybody that Archive 10, let's uh, make sure we put that in the uh, chat room. I'm not sure if Andrew has been putting it up there. The, the website for that is archive-10.com uh, by the STA, STA-Chicago.com. Uh, please check them out. Uh, and. Uh, Terry, very much looking forward to seeing you in person uh, at the gala event this fall. I want to thank you so much for taking some time out and uh, coming to hang out with the design community. Um, it's really amazing, and, and we love everything that you do, and we can't wait to see what that next chapter is for you. Ryan, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Good night, everybody. We're going to do this again next week. Uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Design Chat uh, for more updates on that. And I'm sorry I haven't published any shows recently. I just got back in the country yesterday, uh, and I will be working very hard in the next few days to get some of those uh, last shows out. So hang in there with me, and we'll see you guys soon. Have a good night, everybody.